Hey all, Tom Moran here from Tom's Big Spiders. Well, this one has been years in the making. As many of you know, when I first got into the tarantula hobby, I was one of those bigger is better kind of guys where all I did was research what is the biggest spider out there and I wanted to own it. So obviously Theraphosa blondi or the Goliath bird eater, which is infamous for being one of the world's largest spiders with a leg span supposedly as wide across as a dinner plate, immediately caught my eye and I needed to get one. However, after doing more research, I realized A, they were super expensive and difficult to come by, and B, a lot of folks had trouble keeping them alive because of their moisture requirements. However, after several years, I managed to get a sub-adult Sturmy that turned out to be a mature male. I then got two Sturmy slings that I raised up to a mature male and then a mature female. And then finally was able to get the blondie, a couple blondies that both turned out to be female. However, for a little while, I couldn't find apophysis. And then about four years ago, I was finally able to get a couple apophysis. Well, now we're at a point where I have all three species. They're all adults or sub-adults, and I'm ready to do this video. Now, my hope is for people out there that are looking at Theraphosa that may be intimidated by them, I could take away some of the stigmas that surround them so that they're really not that difficult to keep and maybe attract some folks to check them out. Now, I know there's people out there who say they're just big brown spiders. I get it. That's totally fine. Whatever to each is or our own. But I just think there is something, no matter what color the spider is, about a spider that's about that big around. I mean, Trust me, they are impressive. Now, a note, there are actually four species of Theraphosa now. During a recent revision of Lazyodora, they believe came out in December of last year. Lazyodora spinipes was moved to Theraphosa, so it's now Theraphosa spinipes. However, I don't know if I'll ever see one of these. We'll see if they ever make their way into the hobby. It, they're looking, doing the research on them. I couldn't find much of anything on them, any pictures. So we'll see how that turns out. If they come into the hobby, know that obviously I will have to pick a couple up, hopefully raise them up. And then when the time comes several years down the line, four or five, six years, we'll have to revisit this and do another genus review with that fourth species. But for the time being, we're sticking with the main three, which is Blondie, Sturmy, and apophysis. So let's get into rehousing these three species, talk about their care, and look at some of the world's largest spiders. All right, so we're going to kick this one off by rehousing my Theraphosa sturmi or Burgundy Goliath bird eater. Back in the day, these were much more easy to come by than the Theraphosa blondi. And when folks would find out about giant tarantulas, Theraphosa blondi was where it was at. Everybody wanted the true Goliath bird eater. But the whole thing was kind of silly because the T. Sturmi are just as big and I think just as beautiful. As a matter of fact, there's a debate uh, over which one of them actually gets biggest. Some people say Sturmi get a little bit thicker. Regardless, they're both two huge spiders. And unfortunately, a lot of these, I think, still get imported into the United States, some wild-caught specimens. The first one I ever had was a male. I didn't know it was a male at the time. It was about seven inches at the time. It was the biggest spider I'd ever seen in person. It ended up molting out, maturing to a nine-inch male. And that after that, I ended up picking up two slings. I got a mature male out of one of them. That one was about nine inches. And then the female was over nine inches when she passed away prematurely. To date, I think it might have been my husbandry. She had molted during the summertime. I didn't have her on particularly deep substrate. I was keeping her as more of a terrestrial. And although it was moist, I worry that things dried out too much. So this is one of the reasons why I give all of my Theraphosa, sturm, uh, the Theraphosa species plenty of room to dig now because the deeper the substrate, the more it will retain the moisture and they can dig down to the moisture level they need. Now, this one here is one of the most skittish spiders I had. The first three I had were actually very laid back. This one here has been incredibly skittish. She's in her birth. She was out. And I told Billy, let's see if we can get some shots of her while she's still out. And then she immediately zipped down into her burrow. So what I'm going to try to do is pour a little water in the back, see if she'll come out. If not, I'm going to take off this piece of cork bark up here. Hopefully we can get some shots of her. But this one's been very skittish. My other ones are very laid back. This one will kick hair if caught out. And remember, Theraphosa hair is particularly nasty, so it's not something you really want to get on you. But when I picked up this one, it was about two years ago. She was missing a leg, so her nickname is Stumpy. You'll see that maybe on the enclosure. And she grew a little more slowly than my other Theraphosa species. However, I have been feeding my spiders less frequently than I have in the past. So that probably has a lot to do with it. But a note about Theraphosa slings. A lot of times when you talk about spider slings, you talk about putting them in dram vials or 16 or 20 ounce deli cups. Forget those for Theraphosa species. The slings start off about an inch and a half or 3.81 centimeters. So you want to start them in something a little bit larger. What I've been using 
are the Sterilite containers, like the ones here. This is a Sterilite ID latch container. I use this for a lot of juveniles usually, but this is great for bigger slings. This works great. Or we have right here, this one's still a little dirty, the M Design ones that I don't know if they're still making. They tend to be difficult to find now, but they add, they basically give you enough room to put in a decent amount of substrate, a hide, cork bark hides, sphagnum moss, water dishes. You do want to keep it moist and allows for a little bit of growth. And then when they hit around the three inches, and this goes with my apothesis, with my Sturmy, with my Blondie, you can go ahead and move them into something else. Now for years, I've been using these, these Sterilite containers. They are Sterilite uh, 15 quart clear view latch. They, uh, when they put them in here and they're like three or four inches, it does give them enough room to dig. As you can see, this one here still has a burrow, so they can dig in it. But in the future, I may use something around this size, but deeper, maybe twice as high, fill it with more substrate so they have more room to dig. These have worked out very well for me though. And I'll put the dimensions on the bottom. And that's what this one is in now. She just molted, again, got her, I think 2022. She just molted, her molt was around seven inches. So I'm guessing she's around seven and a half inches or so. But let's see. If I can, sometimes you pour a little water in the back, it'll start all them out. Hmm. Well, a little bit. All I did is probably make it more difficult for me to get her out of there when I have to take the cork bark out. But one thing I want to point out is if you can see one of the big difference between adult Sturmy and adult Blondie. Blondies have hairs on their patella, on their knees. As you can see with the Blondie, I don't know if I can get close enough. Right there on her knees, you can see there's no hair. They're pretty much, it's it, there's hair. There's just not the big hairs like you have down here. When you notice later on, when we do the Blondie, they have quite the hairy knees, but they're still gorgeous spiders. I almost like the sleekness of them. So what we're going to try to do now is I'm going to try to get her out into the catch cup, and I'm hoping that we can get some shots there. Now, what we're putting her into is one of the Barbarous or Reptile Growth 10-gallon containers. These, This will be good for her for a little while. I have a funny feeling. There's no little feel, funny feeling. If she hits nine inches or so, she'll have to go into something larger. But this is going to work for several molts, and I kind of like them because, again, these bases are nice and solid, which allow me to pack in a lot of substrate. So as you can see, there's about four or five substrate uh, inches of substrate up front, about six or seven inches of substrate in back, we have the cork bark hide. I give her a little starter burrow. And I don't know if you can see it, but whoop, she's going back in. Right down here, we have a layer of vermiculite to hold the moisture, some moist substrate. The top's starting to dry off a bit. This one I ended up, I thought I had made all three enclosures up ahead of time so that I could get some good drying on the top layers. But unfortunately, I forgot to set the one up for this one. So I did it yesterday, but I did have some dry substrate that I was able to put on top. And then we have sphagnum moss, leaf litter, I forget what type of leaf litter it is. I want something different this time. And then, of course, a big water dish. So Blondie's definitely moisture dependent. Sturmy's moisture dependent, but they can tolerate it a little bit drier. And we get to the Apothesis. They don't need it quite as moist as some of the other ones. So just something to note there. So let's go ahead and try to get this girl out of here. I'm not sure how this is going to work. Get the now. Nah, we're just gonna get it all. Nah. Maybe we'll actually get the hair one stridulate. All right, there we go. We get a little shot of her there. Sadly, that is called the stress pose when they pull their knees up. And you can see she's already tried kicking some hair. That's the hair that's loose on her. Now, she molted, just so people ask. Their abdomens get quite plump. This one here just molted about a month ago. Keep in mind, a little tip for people keeping Theraphosis species, they can when they get big, they can take a long time before they start eating again. So a lot of people wait like a week for their larger spiders drop some prey in. I've had ones take up to a month to start eating again. It's something to note because I've had people freak out, call me or message me and say, hey, my Theraphos of Blondie, my Theraphos of Sturmy molted a month ago and it hasn't eaten yet. That's very, very normal for these guys. All right, so what we're going to do is try to get this over top of her. And we're going to get the cardboard. There we go. 
kicking. Nope, stop kicking. Oh boy. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so you can see that cup is what, six and a half inches? She, she is, you should she is feel- so mad. <laughs> you should feel the amount of pressure she's putting on this cup. You get her under there. Gorgeous. I love the Sturmy. I, again, it was the, when I got the first one, I bought the, it was like $50. And sadly, I wouldn't do it today because it was obviously a wild caught specimen. But I'm like, I really want to try this out. And I remember unpackaging it and being like in awe of how large the spider was. And since then, obviously, I've had, you know, other ones I've raised up. I have my Blondie, but this will always hold a special place in my heart because I just, it was the first big true giant spider that I had. She's looking gorgeous. And you can see she's almost filling the cup and she's all scrunched up. So she's probably pushing about eight inches or so. so let's go ahead. Stop kicking. Um, heads up. A, obviously we talked about the hairs. That's why I have the gloves on the long sleeves. When you're doing, whoa, is she turning around? Yeah, she's on the cardboard right now. Okay. I'm trying to talk here and you're kind of <laughs> messing with my concentration. <laughs> when you're rehousing and use cardboard, make sure that if they kick hair on the cardboard, you either throw the cardboard away. Actually, probably the smart thing to do is throw the cardboard in the recyclable bin because the hairs will stick to the cardboard. And I've done it before where I'm cleaning up later on. I don't have my gloves on. I touch cardboard with my hands, bare hands, and then get haired. So let's go ahead. Let me get this ready. Now the covers for these... They come off. There's little rivets, plastic rivets you put in the side and turn. I love them because there's ventilation on three. A lot of people are using these now, which is awesome. Ventilation here, here, here. Top is very heavily ventilated. I normally don't tell people to block off ventilation. I didn't have to do it last year with, I have an apothesis in one of these. But if it's you feel like it's evaporating too much, you could always put a piece of plastic over part of it, which would still leave a lot of ventilation. And then there's a feeding port, which I normally don't even use. So these go right on top. This opens up this way. And Billy's going to get some shots. All right, well, just make sure there's no hairs. No, very good. Of this beautiful lady. Yeah, she's got to be pushing probably eight inches or so. What a beauty. And you can see on the abdomen, that's those hairs that are disturbed. Another tip, and this happened to me before. You want me to move the lighter or you got enough light? We got a flashlight over here. Good. Mm. So another tip, when these guys molt, especially larger specimens, when they're out in the wild, they are very vulnerable. So what they will do is they will kick all of the hairs off their abdomens into a pile and roll in it. So they'll be covered in urticating hairs. The first time I saw it was with my female Theraphosa Sturmy. I had no idea what was going on. I thought she had died and been covered in mold. It was the weirdest because it's all this fluffy stuff. That is actually their hairs. So the bad news is if you're trying to get that molt out of there to say sex them or just be able to display it, be very, very careful because those hairs will get everywhere. What I usually do is have a bowl full of water. I carefully pull it out with tongs, put it in the water and try to wash it out and then take it outside and wash it completely off. And I've had good luck with that. But that heads up, if you see that behavior, that means they're molting soon, especially if you find them flipped over and they're covered in hair. And be careful of those hairs. Now, Theraphosa, as far as feeding goes, when they're slings, I feed them twice a week. And they, because the slings are so big, they can take medium to sometimes large crickets right off the bat. And then what I usually start doing is doubling and tripling and quadrupling the number I feed them as they get larger and larger. As they get to be uh, young adults, Usually I'm feeding them large, well, you can feed them a bunch of crickets. You're just going to have to feed them a lot of them. Or I feed them bee doobia roaches. They will eat the big males and sometimes they'll drop in two or three of them. I hate feeding out the big females, but they will eat them too. Awesome eaters. Hit like, hit like trucks. And keep in mind that when slings, just a heads up, slings are very gangly, very light, very long legs, and they are super fast. This isn't mentioned a lot, but they are some of the fastest spiders I have kept when they're smaller. So heads up, if you've got slings, make sure you, when you do your rehousings, do them inside of something so that if they get out and about, you have room to capture them because slings can move really fast, but it makes them even more fun to watch hunt because they take stuff down with such gusto. So there we go. Theraphosa Sturmy, the Goliath, the Burgundy Goliath bird eater. Awesome spiders. Again, could one of these get bigger than the regular Theraphosa Blondie Goliath? Absolutely. So if you have one of these, it's not like you have the bargain brand. You just have another giant cool spider.
All right, next up we have Theraphosa apophysis or apophysis, the pinkfoot goliath bird eater. It gets its name from the fact that slings and juveniles actually have pink on all their feet. They do lose it as adults, but they do have some pretty colors. They got kind of a pinkish tone to them overall. I'm going to go ahead and try to carefully raise this so we can get some shots of this one. Looking gorgeous. Now, this one here, I have two of them that I got in April of 2020. At the time, they were an inch and a half to an inch and three quarters or four to 4.5 centimeters or so. And I found this species grows slightly, so I, I'm sure some people will disagree, but I found that compared to my Sturmian Blondie, the Apophysis grew much more slowly. The first year, both of them hit around three to four inches or 7.6 to 10 centimeters. So in comparison to the other two species that hit five inches, it's a little bit slow, but still a very fast growing species. These guys burrowed a lot more than the other ones, stayed burrowed, and were a little bit more timid as eaters. However, as they put out a little bit of size, they soon caught up with the other ones. You can see this one here, its last molt was close to eight inches. So I'm guessing this one here when spread out is about eight and a half. And then unlike its cousins, these guys are much more slender in life. They have the long gangly legs, unlike the cousins that have the thicker legs, the thick femurs and the thick body. So we'll see what's, what happens when this one puts on some size. But the cool thing about these guys is they get large. Now, again, it's a leggy 10 to 11 inches or 25 to 28 centimeters, which is a big spider. And this was one somebody years ago sent me a photo of the molt of a mature male. It was his last molt. And the molt was almost 12 inches. So God only knows how big that male was. And the males actually have purple on them, which is a nice little touch. I just heard from somebody that was shocked because their male matured out and it's purple. So you could have a 10 or an 11 inch purple spider, which is pretty darn cool. So if Billy backs off from it, what we're putting into, this should look familiar because it's the same one we put the Sturmy into, and this is the same one her sister is in, one of the barbarous growth enclosures or reptile growth enclosures. This is the 10 gallon model. Now what we have, once again, same mix of substrate, leaf litter, cork bark hide. I do expect her to do some burrowing down in here. And then we have the sphagnum moss, and she will be getting a nice big water dish. And this is one of the species that uh, the Sturmy and Blondie, as I mentioned, they're moisture dependent. I've heard these guys are a lot less moisture dependent. They can deal with it a bit drier. But I have found that if I keep the lower level moist, they will dig down to get to that moisture level. But I'm not as obsessive with keeping the whole thing moist. And keep in mind a trick with Theraphosa or any moisture dependent species is you can always put in more than one water dish. I've done it before. As a matter of fact, the one that we're going to rehouse in a minute, which is the Blondie, had two water dishes in at all time. That's a nice way to make sure that you keep the moisture level in the enclosure up. So what we're going to do now is try to cup her. She is, I found temperament wise, both of these were a little more spunky than some of my other spiders and they will kick hairs if disturbed. So what I'm going to do is first, I forgot to put my gloves on. I'm going to put my gloves on because again, I know, and I, I mentioned this, I think, earlier. I, there's some folks out there like, oh, who cares? It's hairs. I just don't feel like itching all day. The hairs can be particularly nasty. I, I'm not too sensitive to these guys, but I don't want to spend the whole day itching. All right, here we go. How are we doing this? Which one are we using? I think we're going to use this one. And we're going to go straight down. And there's the kicking. There's the kicking. <laughs> yep. Oh my gosh. This piece of cardboard is going right in the garbage. I did clean it off after the last one. Make sure I don't get her foot caught. Nope. And I don't know, you can't, she's all scrunched up. But those legs are really long. So although the bodies, and I mentioned with the Sturmy, the fact that they get the, the big booties, big, fat, wide carapace, same thing with the Blondie, just very, very thick and stocky overall. These guys are a little more slender, very gangly though, very leggy. So we're going to go ahead and put her in here. And what we're probably going to do is tilt this over. That cardboard's going in the garbage. I'm going to play. I did clean it off. I'm going to reach around you here, see if we can't get her out in the open again. I mean, you can see there. She's huge. This thing's probably, I don't know, I think maybe six and a half inches or so. And her knees buckled there. 
This leg isn't straight up, so you straighten that up. You're looking at probably eight and a half inches or so. Oh, honey, I want you to go in there. I might just leave her in here if she's more comfortable. I hate leaving them in with these kind of videos, but... Here we go. I don't want to poke and prod too much. <laughs> we go. This needs to be. Ooh. Ooh, the two up. Don't get too, too close because she's going to possibly strike at you and scare the heck. Actually, you can get, some, get a good shot of her. That is called. The threat posture, you can see those two front legs held up to make it look bigger. Fangs are not bared, so this is more just stay the heck away from me, you weirdo. But gorgeous spider, look at her. Wow, it looks pretty. And you can see some of the pinkish hair. I know every time I do a Theraphosa species, we get the old, oh, big brown spider thing. And I mentioned this, the other ones, I love them. So if you don't like them, that's fine. Don't bother getting any, but I absolutely adore them. And again, there's some, some pinkish on them, so you can't go wrong. Definitely pink. So what we're going to do in a minute, I'll probably wait to put her water dish in it until she calms down. But what I'm hoping she will do and what her sister did, I actually gave her sister, I believe, two different burrows. I gave her one on this end and one on this end. She started one, then went to the other. This one I only gave one burrow to because I wanted to give her a much larger one. And I did pack some extra substrate in there. I set this one up ahead of time. And at first, I, it, I allowed it to dry out. Some of the substrate settled, and what I did is put more substrate on top of it to kind of really make sure that she had enough depth. So what will happen is she'll probably dig this thing out, bring some of that dirt up. And then what I've done before is if they dig too much dirt up, I can sometimes go back, or if I think it's too shallow, I can go back and add some more dirt in here. But this one I think will be really good, help keep some, the moisture in. What a beauty. Wow. So we're going to go ahead and put the top on and let this girl relax a bit. Although I probably should put the water dish in first. It'll be a little easier. <clears throat> now, again, as I mentioned with the Sturmy, this is what I've been using for why once they hit around three inches or so, I put them into these, which this did have enough room. If you can see here, oh, there you go. She pulled some of the moss in. That was her burrow until her last molt. So after her last molt, she came out. There's not really, I mean, could she slip under there? Absolutely, but she's a bigger spider now, so this will give her more room. At, look at, okay, hold on. I think she just went in. Oh, nope, never mind. <laughs> I thought I saw her butt. I thought she went in. Never mind. She will hopefully go in there and be able to dig out. That's what the other one did. The other one was in the similar thing. She molted, gave up her burrow. I put her in the other one with the starter burrow, burrowed right down and used it. And again, it just makes for a calmer spider overall. I do catch her sister out all the time. I catch my other Theraphos species out all the time. It's just if they get disturbed, instead of sending up a cloud of that potent hair, they can just kind of scuttle down their burrows and be comfortable. All right. So Theraphosa apophysis, my female, big female, will definitely keep people updated. Her next molt should bring her to probably around nine, nine and a half inches or so. So we'll definitely do an update on that when the time comes. And Obviously, if this spider were to get 10, 11, 12 inches or so, then I would obviously think about moving her into something larger, probably something around 15 gallons or so. We could give her a little bit of extra room, but this will be good for the time being. So there we go. Another one down off to Theraphosa Blondie. All right, next up we have my Theraphosa Blondie or Goliath Bird Eater. Fun fact, back in the 80s and 90s, he's referred to as Theraphosa Le Blondie been reading a lot of older husbandry books, and I thought that was kind of interesting. But these are the second largest spiders on the planet, next to only the Heteropoda maxima, which has a, a supposedly a wider leg span. They get to be 12 inches or so. These guys supposedly can reach 12, but 10 to 11 is probably a little more realistic. But they are huge spiders, and they are the biggest spider in terms of weight. Supposedly, a full-grown adult female can weigh about the same as a puppy, which is pretty incredible. But the – well, take a look at this one over here. This is one of my females looking gorgeous. 
Now, these guys here, if you notice, she's in one of the Sterilite containers. I have completely changed how I'm keeping my adult Theraphosa species. I used to put them in these containers, which she has done well in here, don't get me wrong, but I found that they appreciate a little room for burrowing. So what she's going to go into now, if Billy backs up just a little bit, I'm going to put this on. She's very, very calm. This here is a Lorex plastic 10-gallon aquarium. I have a couple of these. This enclosure was actually shipped with some damage. It got cracked, you know, UPS. And they sent me a new one, but I was able to glue this one back up. And what I did was I set it up, filled it with dirt and everything, and let it sit for a couple months to make sure that it was going to hold. But what we got here, it's a 10-gallon size, but notice that this one is much longer than your normal 10-gallon aquarium. Usually 10-gallon aquariums are higher and a little shorter, so it's got more floor space. I believe it's 24 inches this way or 61 centimeters. Somebody's going to ask, can you go larger? Yes. And if these guys continue to put on size, if they do hit say 10 inches or 11 inches, I will probably put them in a 15 gallons, but I have my other large female in one of these. She does great. She burrowed under here. She, if she gets disturbed, she just goes into her burrow. More often than that, she's just sitting right at the mouth of the burrow. She's very, very calm. And again, we want to give them some more depth for a couple reasons. Number one, this is a moisture dependent species. So we want to make sure that it holds the moisture. And as you, hopefully it's showing up as the line showing up. What we did here, this is moist substrate down here. I have a layer of vermiculite. So when I pour water down, basically I take this bottle here, pour it down so it goes down the sides and soaks down into the bottom. I like the top to dry out a bit so you don't get mold and stuff like that. And you can see the bottom layer is nice and moist. Top layer is dried. What I did was when I filled it up, all the substrate was moist, but I let it sit for a little while. I want that top layer to dry out a bit. And then it dried out so much because it was over the winter that there was only a little bit of moist area down here. I added about half a gallon of water to it. And as you can see, it held it. It soaked in really well. So that's why I add the vermiculite. The su substrate in this one is, again, a mixture of peat, cocoa fiber with the vermiculite. So probably about 45, 45, 10 or so. But I find that I can add the vermiculite. This is uh, usually I get the more the finer vermiculite. This was the kind of thicker vermiculite, but it's working just as well. And that just allows the water to percolate down through and go where you need it. Because sometimes when you set these up, it can be very frustrating because you pack them down real well. You go to add water and it just muds up on the top and eventually evaporates. I want it to go down, keep those lower levels moist. Could you do a false bottom with these? I know a lot of folks do false bottoms. Sure. I've never found the need to do it, but if it's something you want to do to make sure that it's even easier to add that water in there or a different alternative to what I use here with the vermiculite, you put the clay balls, you add it in, feel free to do it. I've just never had to do it. And now as far as the setup, what we have here is half of a cork bark round, the substrate, some green sphagnum moss, leaf litter, and a large water dish. I was going to put a plant in, but the, my other female, I put a plant in the corner. She went out one day after being in there for like a year and a half and just ripped it down, dug a hole, and then that was it. That was the end of the plant. So I'm not going to put a plant in this one. Maybe I'll put a fake one in. If you did a larger enclosure, you'd probably be able to keep the plants a little bit better because they'd be less likely to tread on them. So what we are going to do now is we're going to try to get her from point A to point B. And if you notice, I am wearing gloves again because I've heard people, and somebody's going to come on, it happens every single time, and call me a, a mean name and say that, you know, I should just be doing it without the gloves. I'm sorry. I don't want to be tortured. The hairs on these guys are known to be particularly nasty. I have to say I haven't had bad reactions to the hairs. Ooh, that's really the pink on her knees is really coming through. She gorgeous. Is gorgeous. They always, we always get the big brown spider thing in this one, and I think they're anything but a big brown spider. And even if they are just a big brown spider, they're huge. This one here, I, I don't think I gave the history of this one, did I? This one here I got as about an inch and a half sling or 3.8 centimeters way back in April of 2016 from Fear Not. I got her and her sister. She reached five to six inches or a, in a year or 13 to 15 centimeters. So this is a very, very fast growing species. She's so, oh, look, she's cleaning herself. This is actually pretty cool. I, don't, I almost don't want to move on to the next part of the video because A, that pink is popping on her knees, and B, she's being really well behaved. So this one here, the last time she molted, her molt was close to 9 inches or 23 centimeters, so I'm guessing she's over 9 inches now. So this is probably the largest spider in my collection. The only other one that rivals her is her sister right now or my Lazyodora parahybana or Salmon Bird Eater which that one I believe is right around eight and a half, nine inches or so. I think this one's just a little bit bigger. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to try to cup her with, I like to use this one for larger spiders. 
One of the reasons we do this, and I've had people say, why don't you just shoo them in? A, this is a big spider that if she hits the ground, she's gonna, her abdomen is going to pop. So we don't want to mess around. We want to make sure she's completely secured the whole time. Number two, the hairs are nasty. We want to protect ourselves if, they should, if she should kick hairs. And number three, when you put this type of container on top of the spider, it cuts down on the airflow. It makes them feel much more secure overall, which keeps them calm. And that's what we're aiming for. So what we're going to do here, we're going to take this water dish out, which is not full yet. We're going to drop this gently right over top. I'm going to get this water dish out. I almost plucked this out earlier, but people would yell at me for reaching in there. And now we realize that oh, after all the good planning, there's going to be no, will this fit sideways? Please fit sideways. Yep. All right. This is going to be cool because no, no kicking. We get to feel how heavy she is. Oh my God. The sound is the creepy. The sound is insane. Now this thing here is probably close to eh, seven inches or so, seven and a half inches. And she'd easily go further than that. So there she, eh, not quite as heavy as I thought. I wouldn't say. Not as heavy as a puppy. <laughs> I don't know. It's been a while since we've had a puppy. I know. That is gorgeous. I wish I could get her out with that pose. Now, I'm going to point something out because it cracks me up because I have people come on the videos for the Theraphosa species and they'll ask me, how bad is their venom? It's kind of a silly question because A, the venom isn't bad, but that's besides the point. Their fangs can be three quarters of an inch or 1.9 centimeters. So if this thing were to bite and latch on, just the mechanical damage alone would be worse than probably envenomation. And I do know there was an instance where a friend of mine, he knew a gentleman who got bit by one. It actually nicked the tendon in his wrist and he had to have surgery. So that's no joke. So let's keep in mind, we don't want to, I don't think, A, I'm very a uh, huge proponent of the fact that I don't think anybody needs to get bitten. It's not inevitable. So we want to make sure that we don't get bitten. And B, if we get bitten, the last thing we're going to need to worry about is the venom. All right, so let's get her out. No, you're not going in there. That is not your home. There you go. Wow. What a beaut. So well behaved. And I've had great luck with the Theraphosa Blondie being, both of mine are out quite a bit, even the other one. If she gets to serve, if I take her cage down to feed her or enclosure her down to feed her, she will sometimes bolt into her den. She has a setup similar to this one. But like right now, she's sitting right on top. I'm turn around to look. Right out in the open, which is great because this is one of my favorite species. They're just so darn big. And I know folks say the whole... You know, it's just a big brown spider. You have to see how large they are in person to really appreciate it. And people that see them in person that aren't awed by, and, you know, in awe of them, I, I understand. It just happens to be something that all the years of keeping spiders, the big ones, the ones that get this large, just kind of blow my mind. Man, she's good looking. Look at the size of that carapace. Her carapace, just to give it a sense of scale, is about an inch and a quarter across. So just her carapace this way is about an inch and a quarter across. And those legs, those front legs look to be about what? Four inches, four and a half inches or so. And that's just the front leg. So she is a big, big, beefy girl. What I'm going to do is carefully put her water dish back in. I'm going to add some water so we get some tarantula ASMR here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, you probably can't hear it because the mics are on our necks. <clears throat> so she is an absolute beauty. Now, as far as feeding, I will feed them large crickets. If I feed her large crickets, I usually have to throw in like, I don't know, eight, nine, ten. I keep dropping them as they gobble them up. But what I've been feeding her and her sister lately are adult dubia roaches. Right now, I'm having an explosion of males, so I'll drop in three or four males. She'll eat them up no problem. Is temperatures, I just want to restate this. Obviously, it'll be stating it throughout this video. I have been stating it throughout the video about the temperatures. I know there's a lot of stuff out there that says they have to be kept extra warm. I have people that say, hey, I'm getting a blondie. How do I heat it? I have never had that issue with them. When I first got these guys, the tarantula room in my old house would drop down to sometimes 68. 
They did just fine. Nowadays in the tarantula room, it is about 73, 74 in the wintertime. Every once in a while, drops a little bit lower. And then the summertime, it's about 85, about 80 to 85 usually. So obviously, if your house dips below 60s for a long period of time, I would not keep them like that. But if it's around 70 degrees, they're going to do just fine. If it dips down to 68, 67 for a little while, they're going to do just fine. But uh, like everything else out there, the higher temperatures can lead to faster metabolisms, can lead to faster growth rate. Although with this one hitting, I think this was the one here that almost hit six inches in the first year. They still grow just as quickly, even if it's a bit cooler. So that will do it for this one. Therophosa blondi, the Goliath bird eater. Absolutely love these spiders. I'm glad we got some beautiful footage. I'm glad those colors are popping our legs because at least if somebody says a big brown spider, I can say a big brown spider with a little bit of, uh, what would you call that color? Kind of a salmon -y color, right? Yeah, it's like. And the, you can almost see the, the hair on the legs almost has a pinkish tinge to it. Oh, 100%. It's totally got pink. You're getting some good shots there. Look at the legs. Gorgeous. And obviously, the next time this one molts, this will put her well over nine inches. So we'll definitely do an update then. So a couple main points in this one. Number one, don't go too small when putting them in enclosures because they grow quickly. As we said, two of these species for me grew from about an inch and a half to five to six inches in a year's time. That's massive growth. The apophysis, although they grew a little bit more slowly, and I've heard others say theirs grew just a tad slower than the Sturmy and Blondies, they still grow quickly. And I've heard other folks that have had theirs hit five inches in a year. So mine just grew a little more slowly. Others report faster growth. So keep that in mind. With slings, skip the little tiny containers, put them in something bigger. The ones I showed were great for me. You could try something even a little larger. And then at that point, if they hit three, four inches, put them right into an adult enclosure. They are large spiders. They grow quickly. They're active hunters. They shouldn't have any difficult with some extra room. This is also one of the species that I think if you put them in a really large tank, you could probably plant it. My problem was the tank that I used was decent size for it, but eventually she came out, tore down. One of my blondies had a nice little pothos. It was growing beautifully. One day she came out, tore the whole thing down, dug it all up, and that was it with the pothos. So I've had people say, because of their moisture requirements, would these be good ones to have plants with? Yes, I think the moisture kind of works really well with plants that you're trying to keep alive. You're just going to want to give them more space, maybe two different hives at different ends, because generally speaking, I'm looking over at my two girls. They're both in their burrows now. Every once in a while when they come out, they don't go too far away from the burrow. So they're not going to necessarily use all that extra real estate. And as far as moisture dependency is concerned, a lot of people freak out with this. Again, deep substrate is the key. These guys will continue to burrow right on through adulthood. The, all three of the ones I rehoused have dug out their burrows a little more and are using them, which is fantastic. That's what we want because A, it keeps them calmer and B, when you moisten down the substrate, keep those lower levels moist and the upper levels a little drier, they can go down and find the moisture level that they need, which makes it a lot easier. And again, one of the tips during, through the video, if you're worried that wintertime it's getting a little drier, you've got good ventilation, you're afraid it's going to dry out too quickly, stick an extra water dish in there. It doesn't hurt. They can get a drink from that water dish if they want. Or as the water dish eventually evaporates, the water out of it evaporates, gets into that enclosure, it'll help keep things from drying out too quickly. So that will do it for this one. Really excited to finally have it out. As you know, if you take the time to comment, I will take the time to respond. I'm a little quicker on it now because I'm on summer break. If you want to subscribe, very much appreciate. Click the little circle up there. I'm going to put my uh, moisture video down here where I show how I keep them moist. Something else probably best for viewer up there. Guys, stay safe. Have a great one, and we'll catch you all next time.